views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters.
person that I've worked closely with over the last few years, come to know and love. Um, she is the Montefiore. She oversees the creation and implementation of community and population health strategies, patient education systems, community-based interventions, and the development of Brookside wellness resources at my old Alamar Mastery Medical Center. Um, her interests include the development of effective regional collaborations, and that's what district has been about, collaborations, to increase health equity and reduce the health education information divide between healthcare consumers and healthcare providers. Nicole has a dual faculty appointment at Teachers College, Columbia University, and at Einstein College of Medicine. And the one thing she left off her bio, I just wanted to remind you of this, Nicole, she has been the co-chairman of the BPHC Cultural Response Subcommittee, and she has made huge and generous contributions to our work. And so when we look at poverty, I want to make sure that we put it in context. 
Are you healthy? Are you educated? And what is your standard of living? And so, globally, health can be defined as are you receiving good nutrition? Now, many of you have heard stories about the obesity rates climbing all over the world. And some people equate nutrition to fitness. But a lack of good nutrition can lead to obesity, just as a lack of
patients who are new, our Southerners who are 35 and 40 years old. The data that we're about to cover is really how we get to know your lives. And I think we may be able to surprise them. So to walk you through this process, um, I want to personalize this data a little bit. Because, well, you know, data is data is data. And it's, it means something to you. So I'm going to tell you the story of a little wrong side. This person was born with it on the window of the opportunity office. So it talks about kinds of outcomes. This person's life uh, is this data. Um, they lived in the wrong zip code as well, 452 and 1046, which means there's a little bit of wrongs and a south wrongs experience. Um, they have no students, they have no students. And they've also been the recipient of a range of government sponsored programs, many of which in the simulation are going to have to get. Not only is healthcare services, and for those of you who are, oh, healthcare services are government sponsored, Medicare and Medicaid are government sponsored programs, and so give yourself help government. Someone, for someone who was born in that period of the late 70s and early 80s, you may remember a time before iPhones. You may remember a time before electronic processing. You may remember a time when food stamps were paper. You may remember lots of different things that have changed the experience of what someone is going through as they experience poverty and some of the underground economies that are necessary as a part of surviving uh, poverty. Now, I, I have to forecast, you guys are not going to be able to participate in underground economies huh, as a part of your experience, so no cheating. Uh, but let's, let's look at the data and see what we got. So when we look at children's outcomes, i.e., those born during that time and what they look like now, i.e., your clients, and if you look at your age badges, the vast majority of you fall within this space. Oh, it's going to be a little bit harder to see. Okay, so uh, this is a slide which talks about the fraction of single parents. So let me talk about what you can see on this slide. You can see the difference between light and dark. And the darker the area, the more single parents there are in that space. The lighter the area, the fewer. So if you can see that little red dot, this area right here is Riverdale. And if you notice, it's in stark contrast to, ooh, there we go, uh, to, to several communities in the South Bronx where we see higher rates of individuals with single parents. The darkest colors on this map show rates of 100 communities with 100% single parent households. Now, they're not necessarily female-headed single-parent households, but we know that that is the data. And when we look at Bronx data, specifically information coming from the Robert Wood Johnson community health profiles that are done, we know that in Bronx County, 72% of African-American children are born to a single parent, and 67% of Latino-identified children are born to a single parent. 
And so we know that this data continues to persist with us. When we look at household income, and by the way, all of these slides will be made available to you uh, after the presentation. When we look at household income, we see similar variations. In the Bronx, when we look at all income, all combined, not just low income, what we find is in very similar communities, particularly Riverdale, Throgs Neck, and Pelham Bay, and some of the mid to east Bronx sections, we see higher rates of income, uh, in excess of $73,000 for those communities. But in other areas of the Bronx, particularly in the south, eastern, southwestern areas, we have concentrations of incomes at approximately $11,000, which is hitting at the poverty level. When we look at those same communities for the, those same group of kids, one of the things that's important to look at is the incarceration rate. New York City right now is going through a process where we're trying to close Rikers. Uh, and that's something that's coming out of a lot of advocacy work and hopefully good collaboration between city government and community service organizations. Uh, and that's going to make that effective. But when we look at Bronx County, what we see is overall only 1% of Bronxites go to jail, which is a much lower number than you'd expect. But when we look at particular communities, and again, the darker the color, the greater the rate, you'll see communities where approximately 6 to 8% of those residents are going to jail. And to lose 6 to 8% of your residents when the average age of your population is only 33 years old to any length of incarceration can be problematic. When we look at overall poverty, and this number you're going to hear a lot, it's approximately 29%, 28.6%. And again, we see these very intensive concentrations. And this is not, this is looking at this population that was born during the specific window up through 2010. However, when we look at the number of people who stayed in the same place, and again, the darker, in this case it would be the darker the color blue, the more likely they were to have stayed in the same place, in the same city as an adult, we see a lot of migration. However, that migration is still 70%. So 70% of Bronx residents stay in the same place. So sometimes people will attribute, oh, well, my community is staying poor because new people are moving into it and they're poor too. Well, there's a small amount of truth in that, but the larger vision is that turnover is really about 30% a year. In reality, for most communities, uh, anywhere between 60 to 75% of their residents are the same residents in place. But what we're seeing is, for people who did stay in the same place, their incomes are not increasing. On average, about $40,000, with lows still in the very lowest range to approximately $11,000. And so, of course, we look at, well then, did they not just stay in the same city? Because again, for this data set, if you were born, for example, in 105-1452, as our sample person was, and I've lost my red dot, <laughs> so sort of on the western side closer to Manhattan, if you were born there, regardless to where you moved, potentially your income may have stayed low. However, if we look at the individuals, what we see is their income actually went up a little bit. And so there is progress out of this. And where does this progress come from? The progress comes from people like you. The progress comes from social service providers, from healthcare providers, from individuals who give people an opportunity <laughs> to be healthier, to move around within the space uh, of those other indices. Now, we know the social determinants of health uh, are a tremendous factor in the health of the communities that we serve and the success 
for the communities we serve and in the outward movement from poverty. Uh, we know that economic stability is a primary driver. It's not the only driver, but it's a primary driver. Uh, there's a lot of work that's being done and it's done by you around neighborhood and physical environment, specifically across a range of factors, including housing and transportation, uh, and safety and the availability of green space uh, and accessible safe space. Uh, we know that education is critical, and it's not just traditional education uh, in schools, but it's education about processes, it's education about how the world works around them and how to move up and out of spaces. It's resolution of issues around food and food insecurity, and that covers everything from direct feeding programs uh, to advocacy around improved food. Uh, there's, of course, community and social context. For individuals who were born during that period of time, the picture of the Bronx was very, very different. It was an image of a Bronx that was burning. Uh, and to our borough president's credit, not just his, but all of the ones that have moved uh, from Freddie Ferrer in the 70s uh, to Ruben Diaz Jr. currently, there has been this tremendous push to help the Bronx continue to bloom, to grow, so that those old images are old images, but in many ways it's still a part of someone's mindset. And then not because I'm biased, but we are talking about health. Healthcare systems are more than just hospitals and healthcare providers. They are the social service networks that make it possible. People spend 1% of their time in hospitals and the other 99% of their time as it relates to managing their health happens within social service and care agencies uh, where needs beyond hospitals can be addressed, including very specific cultural, linguistic needs, ensuring that there are quality providers available, and ensuring that there are quality mental health, social services, and other services made available. And so what is the opportunity in poverty? The opportunity in poverty is that it can be changed. Unlike many things in life that are kind of permanent, poverty is not one of them. Uh, as social service providers, we actually have the ability to change the dialogue. But it's very difficult to change the dialogue if you don't have the experience. It's hard to know what you don't know. And so, hence why many of you are here today. Through the integration of strengths-based approaches, including encouraging resilience, encouraging skills development, looking at how data is presented. So it's not, oh, four out of 10 individuals go to jail. It's 60% of individuals don't. And how do we increase that 60% to a higher number? It's about education across all of the various platforms. And it's, of course, about quality service delivery. Individuals who live in the Bronx, Individuals who may or may not be poor, because remember, not everyone that lives in the Bronx is poor. Not everyone who's from the Bronx is poor. But they all deserve quality service delivery. And that is something that we can do. And knowledge of this impact of poverty is what's going to allow you to change it. You can't change what you don't know. You can't change what you haven't experienced. And by having this experience, it is our hope that you will be able to Develop a local solution to, to decrease the gap, because that's where innovation happens. You have the experience, you understand it better because of a broader perspective, and then you're able to innovate to make changes to improve it. And so yesterday, but we couldn't move the meeting to yesterday, but we, but we did plan this, right, Mary? Uh, uh, yesterday uh, is the, the annual celebration for the International Day for the Eradication of Poverty. You know, while we do understand that poverty is part of a global experience, uh, we also understand that there's a local experience of poverty that does need to be eliminated. And part of how the collective we is helping to eradicate that is through knowledge and information. And so, I want to thank you guys for your time and attention. I'm going to turn it back over to Mary, who's going to lead us into our poverty simulation. Uh, again, for all of the data sets uh, that you guys, uh, that we referenced here, again, we'll provide them to you electronically so that you could have them. 
And I hope you do truly take advantage of this simulation. Last but not least, I want to say thank you. Uh, because I was a kid, like, okay, that kid was sort of me, but I was a kid growing up here in the Bronx. I grew up literally right down the street. This was my haunt. I came to this club back before. It was this. I swam in that pool back before. It was gorgeous. You got to see the pool. But it was because of a range of social service and health care providers that I sort of bucked the odds of that statistic. And I want to be clear, the Bronx is not a place to escape. I literally grew up in the Bronx. I lived here till I was 30. I moved to what I call Bronx North, also known as Mount Vernon. But literally every day I work in the Bronx and I have for the last 20 something years. And I went and I did all sorts of fun filled things, including getting a good education. But literally, I was every one of those stats. Poor household, single mom, too many kids. You know, I know what it's like to stand on a cheese line. And it's because of people like you who were able to show compassion and strength and wisdom and a vision for the future that I was able to achieve something different and then come back to contribute to something different. So as you have this experience, keep that in mind and learn because it's going to be you that makes a difference in the life of the next generation of Bronx kids that go on and do great things. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicole, um, for again helping helping us to um, to cross into areas where some people don't want to go, <laughs> but we're trying to deal with what's here, and um, and Nicole has helped us so much in that regard. Speaking of someone that has helped us so much in that regard, before we actually get into the poverty simulation. Um, I want to call up someone who ha I have never seen work harder, ever, anyone. And that is um, our executive director of Bronx Partners for Healthy Communities, Irene Kaufman. Good morning. Good morning to all of you. So I just wanted to thank Eileen for opening up this session and then for Nicole for giving that really informative and inspiring um, welcome. Um, not an easy welcome for me to follow, but um, I really do want to welcome this wonderful group uh, to, to this, today's program. So good morning, everyone. Um, you know, I'm looking around the room today, and I'd really just have to comment on what a wonderful, thank you, on what a wonderful turnout this is. Really, just like look around. Um, so I really just want to thank each and every one of you for taking time out from your very busy days and away from your clients and your patients. Um, to be here with us today for this very important program, which I hope you'll find to be a very valuable experience that's being hosted today by Bronx Works and that is sponsored by Bronx Partners for Healthy Communities. As you may know, um, as you may know, this RIP uh, is the New York State Medicaid redesign program. It's a demonstration project and um, it's all about how we all work together to transform and make the system better. So Bronx Partners actually is one of 25, let's say, coalitions across the, across the state uh, that have been supported through funding by New York State. When we look, and, it's, and each of these coalitions is called a performing provider system because each of these coalitions is actually awarded payment on the basis of how they perform. Bronx Partners is actually a coalition of about more than 220 
unique organizations. And you, all of you in this room, represent some of those organizations. So Bronx Partners, as a district-funded provider, uh, uh, performing provider system, has been charged with making a very important series of shifts in our focus in the way we deliver care. So our focus now is very much more on quality and on outcomes as opposed to the numbers related to visits, encounters, what we've called volume, right? We used to be paid for volume for visits. Now in this changing structure, we're gonna be paid on the basis of how well we impact and improve our, our patients and our clients' health. The focus now is much more on community-based care and much less so on hospitals and institutionalized care. We're driving a focus that's more in tune with prevention and wellness. And although we want to do really right by those who are sick, we want to prevent illness. The focus is really on continuous and comprehensive care as opposed to episodic care. One visit at a time. You see a provider here, you go see a provider there, it's a different provider. That doesn't spell, that has not produced good outcomes. And so we're much more focused on comprehensive care that's built on the relationships we have with our patients. In fact, we're finding what you already may know. And, that's, and that is that putting the focus on relationship building with our patients really produces much more impact um, than you know, focusing on those numbers of how many visits we can do in a day. It's really that relationship building that becomes the heart of change and really what this trip ultimately is all about. So also foundational to DISTRIP is the premise that to give people the best care, that we must look at people as a whole. That care has to be comprehensive and that we recognize and address all our clients, or all our patients' needs. Yes, their medical, yes, their behavioral health, but also their social and economic needs. What we now recognize is that those social and economic needs, as Nicole so eloquently presented to you, really determine the health of our clients, of our patients, of our communities. So this trip is a five-year program. We're already in year four. Actually, we're halfway into year four. And one of our major goals going forward is to make sure that whatever we've achieved so far and have put into motion can be sustained. And we hope that today's event will create a lasting impression that will deepen our understanding of the social determinants and continue to energize our commitment to a community-oriented, patient-centered care, and that will, help, that will help us press forward with the district agenda past the district program years. So while this program um, is, being, um, is being offered in the Bronx, I think probably for the first time, uh, it's not gonna be the last. Uh, we already have uh, a similar program uh, sponsored in December for our behavioral health providers within Bronx Partners. And I'm really happy to report that we will now continue providing these programs in the Bronx. BPHC believes that learning 
through an experienced event, has resilience, has staying power, and we are so pleased that we were able to resource and fund Bronx Works, who with the leadership of Eileen Torres, um, will continue this program, will continue offering it today and into the future. Finally, let me thank Mary Morris, uh, Bronx Works, their volunteers, and our presenters today for launching the program in this borough. Yes. Um, we have a very full morning of programming, and now it's my pleasure to turn it over back to Mary to continue this wonderful program today. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So it's action time now. Um, and I'm not going to say anything more than to introduce Judy Callahan and Marissa O'Leary from West Cop. They'll tell you what that means. And they are going to uh, conduct the poverty simulation. Ladies? Or oh, this is Judy. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. Good morning. Um, so the hashtag is Bronx Works Poverty Simulation. Bronx Poverty Simulation. Hashtags Bronx Poverty Simulation. Okay. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Walk in My Shoes Poverty Simulation. Uh, in answer to Mary's um, comment, West Cop is Westchester Community Opportunity Program, and we are a not-for-profit anti-poverty agency, very similar to Bronx Works, and we're very happy to be invited here to help uh, Bronx Partners for Healthy Communities and Bronx Works offer this poverty simulation today. During the next hour, you'll be participating in a simulation of what it might be like to live in a family with a low income, trying to survive from month to month. Each month consists of four 15-minute weeks. The object of the experience is to sensitize the participants to what it's like, what the day-to-day -day realities are for people who are living with low income, and also to motivate us to re-examine how we view and provide services for those who are impoverished. Each of you, when you entered, were assigned to a family unit, and you were given a name tag. So the name tam tag directed you to your home, your family's home. And there you found a packet of information. Each packet contains a description of your family unit and the individual members. It lists your sources of income, your possessions, your bills, any identification documents, and various other items that you may need to survive the month. During the next few minutes, we're gonna give you and your family some time to review the contents of this packet to familiarize yourself with what your situation is. Please look carefully at these instructions and your family profile because this defines who you're going to be for the next month. I'm gonna give you about 10 minutes to review the packet and during that time, the facilitators, uh, we have several facilitators, both from West Cop and Bronx Works. If you could raise your hand, I know there's a lot of people standing right now, but if you could all raise your hand so that we can see who those facilitators are. If you ha they will be walking around throughout the exercise today, and if you have any questions, those are the folks that you'll reach out to. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna have 10 minutes and part of this simulation, I have a whistle. <laughs> and when I blow the whistle, that means everybody goes back to their home. I'll blow the whistle at the beginning of the simulation and at the end of every 15-minute week. Um, I'm also, after this 10 minutes for, to review your packets, I'm going to give you a little more general information and talk also about the community resources. So our 10-minute review time starts right now. Thank you. 
as possible about your role. Act the age and position of the role you've been assigned. Remember that a healthy teenager doesn't like to sit quietly at home. A young child who hasn't eaten all day will cry and complain. A child is not knowledgeable enough to help their parents and give them advice when they're trying to decide what to do next and how to address the situation. Adults seeking work are oftentimes frustrated and very irritable. Parents can get desperate in their search for food and shelter for their children. So try to think as the role that you are be playing, the age appropriate role that you are playing. There is something called the luck of the draw card that the facilitators will be handing out randomly during the simulation. These represent the unexpected hand of fate. They can be good luck, they can be bad luck. But if you get a luck of the draw card, this is a new situation that has just maybe changed everything for you, but you have to follow the instructions on that card. So it may change everything that you're doing. Transportation passes a very important part of this simulation. It's one of the most critical considerations for families with low income. Community resources aren't always neatly clustered within walking distance of everyone. So you'll need bus fare, you might need gas, you might need walking time to, to move around and get to the places you need to, to go. And with the exception of the school children, everyone needs a bus, a transportation pass wherever they go. When you arrive at a community resource, the first thing you're going to do is ask you for your transportation pass. If you don't have one, then you can't go anywhere. It, it does provide you with a round trip, though, to home. The kids going to school, uh, in the, for purposes of the simulation, take a school bus. That's, that's provided for them. They do not need passes. So it represents the cost of transportation, public or fuel, and maintenance for a private vehicle or time and effort. In your community, particularly during inclement weather or extreme temperatures, that it makes a difference. Each community resource will ask for this pass. If you don't have them, you have to go to the quick cash. That's the only place you can buy transportation passes at the quick cash. Now there's a few other ground rules. When you're figuring your budget, or writing notes, there should be a little pad of blank paper in your packet. Please use that and don't write on any of the other materials because these materials will all be collected and they'll be reused at a future simulation. As I mentioned before, your month is broken down into four 15-minute weeks, which will be designated by the whistle. When I blow the whistle at the end of a week, you have to stop what you're doing. If you haven't made it up to the counter of the bank or wherever you are, the bank is now closed, you go home and you can't, you know, you'll pick that up again next week. The facilitators and I are the only people that you can come to see if you have questions. And I'm, now that everybody's seated, I want the facilitators to please raise their hands again. Please look around and see who these folks are because these are the folks that if you have questions, that's where you have to go. You don't need a transportation pass to talk to a facilitator. The community resources are all around the room, the perimeter of the room. Your family is going to need to rely on these resources in order to survive for the month. Please pay close attention to what each resource does because you don't want to waste transportation passes going to the wrong place. I also want you to note that during week three, those of you who have children, school is closed. It's a holiday week during week three. 
So your children will not be going to school. You have to take into consideration what plans you're going to make for your children and childcare during that week. So right now I'm just going to announce what the community resources are and I would ask those folks to please raise their hands so you can see it's going to be very helpful if you know where you're going. We have the Friendly Utility Company. Where is the utility? Okay, across on, on the back wall there. The Mortgage and Rent Collector in the back corner. Department of Social Services. Okay. Social services, um, if you're receiving benefits or you want to apply for them, that's where you would go. The school, if you're playing the, the part of a school-aged child, you need to go to school every day. So where's the school? In the back. The interfaith services can provide shelter if you're homeless. They can also provide assistance with food and transportation and referrals to other agencies. So the interfaith service, down along this, this wall here. Child care, if you have children that are not school age, and that includes your babies, um, they can provide child care. So that's where you would, you would head for that. The Foodorama Supercenter, also along my, to my left here. You buy food, you get your prescriptions filled. The bank. The bank, if you need to cash checks or apply for loans. The general employer is right next to me here to my right. If you have a job, if your packet says you're employed, this is where you go. Community Action Agency, over here. They can help with food and utilities also. Police officer, if you need assistance. That's the police department over there in the corner. We have an illegal activities person, and this person will be encouraging illegal activities throughout the simulation. Where is that person? We can't, oh, we can't point that out. I'm sorry, Alex. <laughs> Community health doctor. Uh, we have a doctor available to address your health needs along the back, this wall here. And we have Big Dave's Pawn Shop. If you need to sell something for additional cash across the room here is the pawn shop. And then the quick cash. The quick cash, as I mentioned before, is where you go to get transportation passes. You can cash checks, take out a payday loan, or a vehicle title loan. If you're employed full time, you need five transportation passes for the week to get to work. And you must be present at your work site for seven minutes. That represents your full time job that week. You also must arrive at work within the first three minutes of the start of the week. So we recommend that if you're employed, go to work first. Arrive on time, put in your seven minutes, and then you have eight minutes left in the week to take care of other family business. If you're employed part-time, again, we recommend that you go there at the beginning of the week. You have to work for four minutes if you're a part-time employee and it requires three transportation passes each week. If you show up late with five minutes left to go in the week, you won't get paid. So timeliness is important as it is in a real job. There may be some terms in the simulation that you're unfamiliar with. EBT stands for Electronic Benefits Transfer Card. This is the card that's issued by the Department of Social Services for SNAP benefits, formerly known as food stamps, and it's also for cash benefits. TANF, T-A-N-F, Temporary Assistance for Needy Families. This is a federal program to provide cash benefits, again, with the EBT card. So if you have that card in your packet, it means you are already receiving assistance and the amount of your benefit is written on the back of the card. If you don't have one and you need help, you need that assistance, you may qualify for benefits and that's when you would visit the Department of Social Services to apply. Keep in mind that your goals during this month are to keep your home secure, feed your family on a regular basis, make sure your utilities aren't shut off, make your loan payments, pay for miscellaneous expenses, and meet any unexpected situations, the luck of the draw cards. If you work, you need to go to work, you need to go on time, 
You need to take care of your children. Your school-age children need to go to school. Child care needs to be provided. And after the month is up, you'll have a chance to reflect on and talk about your experience during the debriefing session. So we're going to go ahead and start. I'm going to blow the whistle. That will be the beginning of week one. When I blow the whistle again, that will be the end of the week. And again, you'll return to your homes to discuss your plans for next week. Okay, are we all settled? Everybody has everything returned to the kits. Thank you very much. I want to start off by asking anybody, just by a show of hands, anybody feel angry? It's okay. How about aggressive? Did it, did it bring out any aggression in anybody? Frustration? Huge one. Depression? Hopelessness? Okay, that's a majority of people in the room responding to that. Uh, I want to ask one family in particular, I want to start with them because it appeared that they, had, they really, really fell on hard times. Not that anyone had an easy time of it. But I'd like to ask the folks who were playing the roles of the bowling family if they'd be willing to share a little bit of what their experience was, how they felt, how it made them feel. Okay, so um, I was a 10-year-old. Bart and um, talking to oh I was ten years old and my brother Brian was eight and he always wanted to buy drugs and sell it because we had no money for food. Our sister was sixteen and she was pregnant seven months and then she died. Um, mom had to miss school. Mom had to I'm sorry miss work a few days because we had no transportation money for like no gas for the car and that is not working. Even though we paid our mortgage, it was already late. Um, they evicted us, and we were just always hungry. At school, I needed glasses for $50, and no one wanted to lend me their glasses. And um, we all, also, at school, the teacher um, made us leave early because we did not have any money for um, the school supplies. So we had to walk home because they did not want to give us the school bus. Um, yeah, it was just really frustrating as a 10 year old because I had to assume the role of protector for my little brother. Um, eventually he did end up the police uh, took him. I was just so tired watching him all the time and hungry. I tried to go to my house um, to stay because we got evicted. Uh, they had no lights in their um,
being an eight-year-old and just trying to navigate all of these things that are going on and not really understanding everything, um, but still trying to figure out how to make it and survive. So that was my experience. So did any of you have discussions in your family about your mental health, about how your anxiety or your depression was affecting the way you interacted with one another, how you were able to cope? No one? No time. Okay. Yeah. For those of you that, that were, ended up being deceased by the end of the simulation, what happened? Why did you choose not to go to the doctor? So we had some kids that were asthmatic. We had senior citizens that had had strokes and we had some pregnant teens. I didn't die because of no medical illness. I went to the pawn shop to hustle money for my family and a stranger came by and helped me up and I refused to give up the money. So they shot me and took my money, my ID, and I am, I was the senior citizen person who was disabled. But then I get a, a note saying, oh, you're, you're dead because it's medical. So it's a farce, my family needs to sue someone. Hi, I was a 57 year old male who was partially paralyzed and I was on disability. My son-in-law and was working and my daughter was busy around taking shopping doing the groceries. My focus was more on making sure my son-in-law gets to work so he could pay the bills, my daughter do the necessary things she needs, but then we got the eviction notice, my focus was on everything else besides me because I wanted to make sure my family, me being the senior person, was good and okay. And my daughter had to, my granddaughter had to get to school and take care of herself because she got suspended. That was a concern. So that bring, brings up a topic of isolation with seniors. Anyone else play the role of a senior? Okay, so my name is uh, Pablo Perez. I'm 21 years. Okay, my name is Pablo Perez. I'm 21 years old. Um, I felt isolated throughout the whole entire simulation because while my two twin sisters were in school and my little brother was in daycare, I was literally running around by myself trying to pay bills, trying to get food, trying to get money. I never won, I didn't even go to school. I was supposed to be in university. I never made it to school one day trying to make ends meet. And I felt really bad for my little brother who's three, year, three, three years old because he was alone the whole, basically the whole entire time. So I noticed that he really didn't talk, he didn't know his ABCs, and I can foresee that, you know, as he's continuing in school, he's gonna have some kind of delay or he won't do well in school. Good morning, everyone. So I am Stella Smith, and my experience was really, really rough as a senior, 85 years old with arthritis, homeless, moving from point A to point B without transportation. I have my check two weeks without getting it cash. So it's, and to the point where I have a happy ending where I got an apartment, I got a refrigerator and I got a stove however no one walked me through the process to say okay this is what's gonna happen now you have all of this let's take you to a realtor or whatever the case is so this is everyday living and it's it's really touching to see social services how they treat others how we sometimes treat others and it's a reality check for us to really 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 be intentional in helping others and providing the best services we can so our community will be better and healthier so that is just my hope for all of us thank you thank you if anyone like to come up here and use this microphone as well, I, I'm connected to a cord, so I can't travel around, but feel free to come up here if you'd like to speak.
So how many people ended up homeless at the end of the simulation? How many people ended up better than they started during the simulation? You were doing a little better? Because you started where? So she started homeless and she ended up having an apartment at the end. How many people here think that there is money to be made out of poverty? Can you, what do you think that happens? I don't know, I was gonna be put on blast, but. <laughs> um, several areas, the pawn shop, the payday advance, um, the very fact that I couldn't walk and I had to use transportation, um, those were my experiences. And the idea, um, piggybacking on what she said, things not being explained. So if things are not explained, for example, when I actually sat and reviewed what I needed to pay for for the month versus the week, I realized by the time I paid for my weekly food, I had just missed paying for whatever monthly payment I could have paid for, which means that now I have to calculate transportation, which means now I have to calculate how I'm gonna have that transportation if I had that money allocated for something else. So absolutely, I think that poverty is a means of other people getting rich. So you understand that landlords charge extra per day when you don't pay your rent? Because you don't have a bank account, you have to pay an extra fee at the local check cashing place, right? Yes? Um, so I, I observed that um, I was a 25-year-old black male who had spent some time in jail, and I was very curious about what my colleagues at General Employer were making because I kept seeing numbers that were much higher on their paycheck than mine. No one else had a paycheck that was the amount that I had, and it was the lowest one. And I started asking people, how long have you worked here? Can I see how much you make? And people didn't want to share that because they saw how little I was making. So that you also know people who have been incarcerated and people who owed certain bills, that was a garnishment from different governmental agencies, whether you had a child or not, these are things that end up costing you. You probably thought on your statement it said you were gonna get 300 and something dollars and you got 128. Those are garnishments that happen to this family. Somebody has something? While running around to pay bills, I was late to pick up my little brother from the childcare and they charged me $10. How many children here were neglected by the parents? So a lot of the children here neglected. The parents that are in those families, do you realize that you were neglecting them? What were the reasons you neglected those ch the, the children in your family? Do you wanna? At the very beginning, I really felt quite depressed because I felt so powerless to do anything to help the situation. I looked at the bills and I looked at the amount of money that was coming in and I knew that we couldn't make it and it took every minute I was unemployed I was a father I was unemployed and it took every minute of my time to like finagle the money so that we made it through the month so as you I walked around the room there were a lot of complaints about social services only having one social worker. The bank only having one teller because all of a sudden you notice all the banks have what? Machines and you're expecting seniors and adults to just simply go in and know how to operate and the lines get longer and things start happening. So within the communities there are a lot of deficiencies in services that you're expecting people to be there and then they're getting out and it's two, three hours later and they're still sitting in social services. And we're sorry that we had to play also part in the reality of this because once again, is a simulation, is not a game. So I, I, I'm just so impressed that all of you kept the character because a lot of you were coming at me as the characters that you were 
And, you know, so all of that. I was wondering if any of the volunteers, any of the um, Anna or anybody else, what was your experience like getting a mob of people? You, you wanted something to say? Who? Yeah, so we have our illegal activities person. It was very funny, nobody noticed her with this bright green shirt. But she was in charge of sometimes, you know, doing some of the things that you came back and you were wondering, where, did, where is this? Where did I leave it? So I noticed that a lot of you didn't care about your uh, furniture. Like you just left the furniture and you didn't ask about it. Um, I grabbed a couple of uh, social security cards. So many of you lost social security cards. Unfortunately, she had to kill somebody that did not want to give up her be his belongings. And I noticed somebody's still wearing her name tag, so please uh, put your name tags back into the, uh, yeah, we need those. So, in, I mean, the experience today for the poverty simulation is to hope that all of you go back to your programs, to your offices, to your sites, and you understand that the services that we're providing to people in the community, we have certain expectations. We expect people to get there. We expect people to go over there. We expect people to come back. We expect people to go to another department. And then little do we always consider that what's going on around the community and what support are they receiving. So we hope that today from this experience, what you get is how can you turn services, what programs, what things can be developed within your organizations that can help enhance the life of community members. When we did this with our board a couple of weeks ago, it was a eye-opener. What services, how can we improve you know, the services that we provide in Bronx Works? What are areas that are lacking within the community that we can then look for to help improve within the communities that we have around us? the expectations that we have for people versus the reality of their lives, sometimes we don't take a moment to ask, what is their situation? Did they cash their check? Why are they here so late? Why are children being neglected in school? Teachers don't have enough funds. They don't have enough supplies. I intentionally didn't give you enough paper, enough pens, because in school, kids don't show up with pens and paper. You have to share. So there is a method to the madness that yes. happened today. Trust us, believe it or not, so. And Alex, this, this group is very focused, obviously, on health care, health equity. Um, and this is not the first simulation that we've done. And even with this group, it was very interesting how everyone seemed to neglect their health care. Um, we had a doctor, we had a you know, hospital, we had services, but people were so preoccupied with everything else that they were trying to deal with, and in, particularly in the case of parents, um, they neglected themselves, they neglected their health care, and, and this, is, this has held true across all groups that we've seen in our experience with this simulation. So I, I found it very interesting that with this group that was still one of the major areas of neglect. Hi. I, ju I just wanted to add one thing. You were talking about neglect and how the populations that we served. One of the things that happened was my 15-year-old granddaughter, um, our lights got cut off and everything was off. Um, Mom had to go take care of the business and try to get our lights back on. She wanted to come with her. She says, you're 15 years old. You can stay here by yourself. And she says, no, but I'm staying here in the dark by myself. She was like, yeah, you can stay. I think one of the things we do with adolescents, we forget about them. They're still children. Yeah. They still need us. Will we leave a yeah. five-year-old home alone? No. Yeah. Why are we leaving in the dark? Why we leave a 15-year-old? So I think our adolescents also need to be realized they're still children. Yeah, very good point. A lot of children have a lot of adult-sized burdens on their shoulders.